Five prisoners, all serving life sentences, broke out of Dorchester Penitentiary in New Brunswick, Canada, in the middle of the night on July 17, 1970. Lemuel Fleming, age 41, George Hannington, age 29, Jack Fisher, age 32, Sam Wetmore, age 36, and John Lee Parker, age 27. They discovered an abandoned property, or so they believed, 20 kilometers from the prison while trying to flee. Two days afterward, the warden was informed by two of the prisoners about the graphic details of their experiences at that farm. This account is from John Lee Parker, one of the prisoners. The lads and I had spent months organizing our escape. If we could, we intended to travel to America where no one would be aware of our identity. We were aware that we had to leave this place as quickly as possible. We left in the middle of the night, I believe about two in the morning. After escaping the fortifications, we headed north with the intention of heading west after we crossed the Memramp Cook River. The sun was rising when a farm came into view, I'm not sure how far or long we ran. We thought we'd gone far enough away to be able to take a little rest because we were hungry, thirsty, and exhausted. As we approached the farm, I noticed that it was dilapidated and unusable as though it had been abandoned for a long time. The plants around the house were overgrown, and the house itself appeared unclean. It appeared as though the barn might collapse in on itself. We took our time and cautiously approached the house because we weren't sure if anyone still lived there. We made the decision that, as soon as we were a few meters away from the house, two of us would knock on the front door to see if anyone was home, and the other three of us would go to the back door in case anyone inside decided to try to flee. Our strategy was to tie up everyone we thought might be present so we could acquire some food and drink before moving on and jogging. Along with two of the other boys, I went to the rear door and stood there watching to see if anyone came racing out. After a few minutes, the door opened unexpectedly, revealing Jack. The rest of us stepped inside once he indicated there was nobody inside so we could start looking for food and drink. As awful as the outside of the house was, so was the inside. It smelt musty and was filthy. It appeared as though some untamed creatures had made their home there for a while. We looked everywhere for food, but all we found were a few cans of beans and beef. Jack instructed Sam to go outside and check if there was a well nearby because the indoor faucet was not working. After 10 minutes, Sam finally let out a cry, get out of here. Everybody started running out the rear door. We heard Samuel say, I'm in the barn, come in here right now. Once we were outside, we noticed the barn doors were ajar as we dashed in its direction. We waited a moment, staring at each other, unsure of what to expect, before heading inside. Already, we were tense and nervous. It was rather dark inside the barn, and I was alone. My eyes adjusted to the darkness as soon as I stepped inside, and I saw Sam standing in front of me with an odd expression on his face. Then I happened to see what looked like a man a few meters away from Sam out of the corner of my eye. I turned to face him and saw that it was, indeed, a guy. He was gazing at me while standing there. He appeared to be in his sixties, with long silver hair that reached his shoulders. The guys stopped dead in their tracks as soon as they noticed the man following me in my footsteps. We remained there for a while, observing the man and Sam, and then Jack said, Who are you, old man? Are you a local? The man just stared at me without saying anything, he didn't respond. After a minute, Jack asked the man once more, more firmly this time, who he was and whether he lived there. Jack was always a prick, so I knew that if he didn't respond right away, things would get serious for him. After another minute, the elderly guy carefully turned to face Jack and said, I do live here and have for a long time, in a composed, assured tone. The elderly man had a faint accent that, at the time, I was unable to identify. Jack, who was well aware of Sam and George's temper, then ordered, Sam, George, take that chair over there and find some rope and tie up the old man. They spent no time in locating some bailing twine and grabbed a chair that was close by. The old man did not resist or speak as they grabbed him and tied him to the chair. His expression remained expressionless as he kept staring at Jack. I felt a sharp pain, there seemed to be something wrong with this man. Seeing evil had come naturally to me because of my father, who killed my mother when I was 14 and was a devil to my siblings and myself. However, I kept my feelings to myself since I was not going to appear weak in front of the boys. 
Then Jack asked Sam whether he had discovered a well with water in it, to which Sam said that he had, and he was told to go get the canned food we had discovered inside the home. What's your tale, old man? Jack asked the elderly man as Sam walked away. How do you survive in such a hellhole? The elderly man initially just sat there scowling at Jack without saying anything. Let me tell you gentlemen a story because it appears like I could be here for a time, he added when he eventually spoke. I was born in Cistron, France, a very long time ago. Approximately when you were a young man, I believe a horrible incident occurred to me. I haven't been able to pass away since. I wish for death instead of fearing it. I have just so many days left to live on this godforsaken earth. Gentlemen, based on your clothes, I can tell where you're from. What kind of business you run or plans you have are irrelevant to me. I merely ask that you depart before dusk. Sam was astonished when he entered at that moment with a bucket of water and the tinned food. We all had a start and Jack made light of the whole thing by saying, crazy old man, Sam, bring me the food and water. I was scared of the old man because of what he said and the manner he said it. This is not how someone who is insane speaks or acts. The old man turned to face me, bent his head, and remained silent. After that, we went to a part of the barn that had enough light for us to see when we ate. We shared what little we had as we sat and handed the food cans among us. I could not get rid of the unsettling impression that this old man was dangerous, even when the other boys engaged in frivolous chat about their intentions once we arrived in America. Jack said, someone needs to go take first watch on the loft, after we had finished our meal. Since there are many kilometers of open space around us, it would be preferable to travel at night to avoid being seen. It should take the dogs some time to detect our smell because we crossed multiple rivers on the way here and traveled upstream before returning to shore. George then announced that he would take first watch while the others made our way to various areas of the barn in an attempt to make ourselves comfortable so we could sleep. The next thing I recall is that Lemuel shook me up and told me it was my turn to watch since he had just finished, indicating that I had been asleep for a number of hours. I turned to face the elderly man as I walked toward the ladder that led to the loft. His expression was expressionless as he glared at me once more. He appeared completely unconcerned about the fact that five fugitives had bound him to a chair and had no idea what would come next. We would be departing in a few hours when I arrived at the loft and peered out one of the windows to observe that it was now late afternoon. Before we left, I wondered what Jack had planned for the elderly man. I took a seat on a barrel that the other boys had been using as a viewing platform and started daydreaming. I'd fallen asleep and I jolted myself awake. When I leaped from the barrel, I saw that dusk was almost here. The boys had to be still asleep or they would have definitely woken me up by now, so I hurried down the ladder to check. I was shocked by what I saw when I downed the ladder and turned to face the elderly man. He simply vanished. When I rushed to the chair to investigate, I discovered that the bailing rope we had used to tie him up was shredded and sprawled across the floor. I shouted to the boys to get up and hurry. They were all as frightened as I was and came hurrying to my side in a matter of seconds. He didn't seem powerful enough to tear through the bailing twine and Sam and George had done a good job tying him up. It was becoming dark inside the barn soon, so I asked Jack, what should we do now? Abruptly, we detected sounds emanating from a chamber in the rear of the barn. Let's get out of here, Jack, Lemuel said as he stood up. We have to leave because it's difficult to see inside, but before we do, I want to make sure I give the elderly man a proper farewell. He is aware that we are freed prisoners, he must be in one of those rooms back there. Just wait here, Jack said, if you guys are too afraid to walk back there and get him with me. All right, but move like crazy, I answered. Jack began to move gently in the direction of the barn's back. In rear were multiple stables and at least three rooms. Jack pretended to be a tough person all the time, but I knew he was a coward. We all four watched as Jack vanished into the night. With the exception of a little patch of moonlight peeking through the old wood cracks from the rising moon, visibility inside the barn was becoming increasingly limited. I felt I would pass out at that moment since I was shivering so much and perspiring so much with anxiety. Just as Jack was screaming, you son of a, I heard something snarl. Then he was silenced. The four of us moved quickly to leave that place behind. A few meters behind us, we turned and rushed towards the barn doors. 
The doors would not open even after we pounded on them and attempted to push them open. When we discovered why we couldn't open the doors, we scrambled around for a while. We were locked inside after someone had inserted a chain with a padlock through the doors. What on earth are we going to do at this point? May I ask George? I answered, find a way out, come on, we need to leave here now. Let's search for a spot where we can fit through, I proposed. I heard what sounded like another snarl as we began feeling our way along the barn wall to see if we could discover an opening. Then we saw something swiftly approaching us on four legs. I exclaimed, what's that? Sam gave birth to a terrifying scream and exclaimed, help, in an abrupt and unexpected manner. I'm feeling something, he was still screaming when all of a sudden it seemed like something was tearing out of his mouth, and he stopped screaming right away. Come on, Johnny, let's get the heck out of here immediately, Lemuel then screamed. I just started to run as fast as I could away from Sam screaming without saying anything. I kept slamming into objects as I went through that dark barn, nearly passing out multiple times. I turned around and stood trying to regain my breath until I got to what I believed was the back of the barn. It was completely silent while I stood there. There was no sound, no movement. The world seems to have stopped. After a short while, I heard a murmur, Johnny, is that you? It's me, Jack. I instantly froze and tensed up, saying, I think I found a way out of here, come here. I pondered, I heard Jack scream really loudly. Is he still alive? I was unsure of what to do, but I knew I didn't want to stand there waiting to be the next person, so I moved when I heard someone mumble. Come on Johnny, get over here, or coming from the shadows. I heard Lemuel's spine-tingling screams coming from the loft area, and I cautiously started to creep towards the sound of Jack's voice. I was starting to go faster in the direction of Jack's voice when I unexpectedly stumbled across something on the ground. It gave a groaning noise that startled me. Jack said, Johnny, it's me, Jack. Help me up. As I bent to assist Jack in standing up, I came into contact with a warm wet pool on the floor. I could smell the distinctly smell of blood when I put my hand up to my nose. I scrambled for a little longer and eventually discovered Jack's arm, which I used to help him off the barn floor. At that moment, I saw the moonlight peeking through and could make out the exit that Jack had claimed to have located. Jack was mutilated and bleeding, so we moved as quickly as we could. I pushed on the barn's paneling when we arrived at the opening where light was coming through, and it opened up just enough for us to pass through. We started walking back the way we had come after we were outside. As I assisted Jack, I couldn't help but glance over my shoulder, believing that we would undoubtedly be the next group. We walked all night long in an attempt to avoid being as close to the farm as we could. We found a main route to try and seek some aid when it got light enough. It was not long before people realized we were runaway prisoners and the police came to pick us up. I had assumed that Jack would pass away at some point throughout the night but the tenacious bastard persisted. The warden informed the local police who subsequently visited the property to look into John Lee Parker's account. A few of the men reported that the barn smelled like an animal's den when they entered. They discovered the elderly man reading a book in a chair on the loft while they were looking through the barn. What took you so long, was his reply when asked who he was. He was taken into custody in connection with the alleged killings of Lemuel Fleming, George Hannington, and Sam Wetmore. Under one of the rooms, they discovered a hidden room when they searched the barn further. Sam and Lemuel were among the several dozen persons whose bones were found within. With the exception of some relatively recent tissue that was still covering the bones, the bones had been plucked clean. The entire property was searched throughout the course of the following month. Although the number of deaths discovered on the property was never precisely counted, experts believe that up to 100 separate remains may have been discovered there. The bones or body of George was never found. They also examined the house and discovered a lot of antiques, some of which were from the 1700s. An old photo that fit the elderly man was discovered. According to experts, the image was taken in France in the 1850s. Since the farm had been deserted for 30 years, no one is sure how or when the elderly guy arrived to reside there. 
The elderly guy received a prison sentence, which he served out until 1984. He disappeared one day in the summer of 1984. It's believed he got away. Despite organizing a search, he was never located. Over the years, a different family who bought the land the farm was on has reported that they occasionally saw an odd older man strolling around the farm's perimeter. Other times, he would just stand there and stare before turning to go back into the forest. I don't dispute it, the elderly man replied to the warden when he was asked if the tale John Lee Parker had recounted was real. The elderly man would never reveal his identity to the authorities, earning him the nickname The Old Guy. Jack managed to survive his wounds, but the terrible damage to his left arm required an amputation. His narrative aligns with John's narrative. John Lee Parker replied, a werewolf, when the warden questioned him about what he believed murdered the other men. 